after the presentation for pie and ice cream because there's some awfully good looking pies back there. And I do really think the price is right. So I think you could even have a couple of pieces and afford it. It's not going to break the bank. We do that because of high gasoline prices. So, so Gary, I don't think Gary does need an introduction, and I'm not going to give him one other than say that we're glad that we could again sponsor Gary along with Kelly's technical help for a presentation. Some of you may have seen the beginning of this about two years ago, Gary, when the first time you did this, two, two and a half. Or maybe three, two and a half. Yeah, two and a half, three that, years yeah. ago. But it's been modified, it's been, uh, I think identifications have been made, and I think you're going to enjoy it very, very much, even though you may have seen the one before. So Gary, uh, we're looking forward to it. Well, welcome to everybody that wants to know a little bit about what Cochrane used to be. And I think we've really got a tremendous collection of, uh, of really great old pictures of Cochrane. Probably better documented as far as any community in Buffalo County than any of the other communities in Buffalo County. Can you guys see back? good enough over there in the corner? You know, it's, just, it's not a church, you know. You don't have to be way off to the corner and in the back necessarily. If anybody's got any questions along the line, if you've got any identifications of people that we don't, just sing them out. Kelly over there is our executive director for our historical society. He's the one that basically put the slideshow together. And um, uh, any further information that we can get for it, we want to have for it. Now, you'll notice we're starting out down memory lane with a walk through the streets of Petersburg and Cock. And there may be even some people that don't know that this was used to be Petersburg. And you can maybe say, how come it was Petersburg, you know? Well, the fellow that owned all the land that was where Cochran is now was a fellow named John Peter Schnook. And here's John Peter Schnook. And you can see, he, this comes off our Buffalo County Pioneer picture. You can see over there on the bottom right, he came to Buffalo County in 1854. So he was one of the very first settlers that came along. The very first settler settled in Fountain City and in the, what was called Holmes Landing at that time. And then the ones that settled a little ways away that were particularly interested in farming tended to settle in the Belvedere area and pretty much up in the Cochran part of Belvedere. And uh, John Peter Schnell owned just about all the land that Cochran's on right at the particular time. And uh, he owned this land. So what happened then was Buffalo City was developed, and quite, a, quite developed by that time already, when Cochran first started getting developed. But what really led to the development of Cochran, of course, was when they brought the railroad through. And when the railroad came through, it was 1886. And they bought the right-of-way for the railroad from John Peter Schnook. Uh, the uh, railroad was interested in putting a depot in this area because they wanted one every so many miles and they wanted to develop a community here. So they bought a lot of extra land from John Schnook. And what happened then was that that was sold to a group called the St. Paul Land Company. And they were a development company and they laid out lots and started selling lots. Well, that community first was called Petersburg because John Peter Schnook didn't go by John, he went by Peter. He was Peter Schnook. And so this was Petersburg and it was Petersburg for quite a substantial period of time. We don't know exactly when it changed from Petersburg to Cochrane, but we do know that the newspaper accounts are still calling it Petersburg back in 1889. So quite a while it was called Petersburg. Now, the next thing that we can maybe say, you know, is when did they change to Cochrane? Well, when they decided to change the name, and this was before the town was say, incorporated, which was 1910, but when they changed the name, they decided to change the name to a uh, fellow whose last name was Cochrane, and he happened to be a conductor on the railroad. He was very popular locally in the community. I imagine every time the train stopped, everybody was up there to get the mail or talk or something like that, you know. And everybody got to know Cochran real well, so they named the town Cochran. 
Now this is a real early picture of Cochrane. And this picture was actually published for GM Roar, and we figure it's about 1907 that the uh, picture is because that date's marked on the card that we've got in pencil. It's hand colored, it was hand colored in Germany, so it was a picture taken over here, sent to Germany, and back at that time the storekeepers had a lot of their uh, merchandise um, produced over in Europe and sent back here again. And you'll notice that down here on the front here, you look, look for Highway 35, you notice it isn't there. No Highway 35 going through at all. That's because the main road was right through the village of Cochrane back in those years. Then we've, we've got some more pictures of early Cochrane. This one's a bit later. You'll notice the one before was called Bird's Eye View, and that was taken from the top of the bluff. This one, of course, is an aerial view, so when we know we've got to be getting up to the time of the airplanes. And um, this time, let's look for Highway 35 again, and we, we find that it's there. We got Highway 35 on the other side of the road there, I mean the other side of the railroad tracks. Uh, I was trying to think of just when Highway 35 was put through in that particular area. I remember I was a little boy. And uh, so that puts it back quite a few years ago. I'm trying to think that it probably was the late 30s or maybe 1940 when Highway 35 was put in. If anybody knows that exact date, let us know. Anyway, uh, I know I was playing uh, with uh, George uh, uh, Laverne Engel at his house, which was right across from there. Every time you hit the wrong button here, it changes. <laughs> and we used some of the freshly done blacktop to pave our own little blacktop road that we were making back in his backyard. And so that's about the time that I think that probably Highway 35 probably came through. So that must, so this picture would have been taken sometime after that. You'll notice Goose Lake in there. you notice it's pretty well developed. you notice the high schools in here. Now let's see, this is a very early picture here. This is one taken from up on the bluff yet. And this includes some things that only the oldest people here probably will remember, and which I can't remember being there. And you'll notice in the, this machinery is pretty tricky, Kill. You'll notice right here in the middle there what looks like a green elevator. Only you'll notice that it's uh, not on the truss, not in the location where our present grain elevator is. That was the first grain elevator in Buffalo. I mean, in um, in Cochran, and it was. If we look closely at it, we can see it was the R. D. Jones grain elevator. And you'll see over to the right, we had quite a bit of trouble trying to figure out what this was. You know, two ramps going up and down, and actually that was the grain. The green elevator, that was the ramp for the wagons, and they pulled the wagons up those ramps, and then they dumped them into bins down below, which were about the height of the boxcars. And then the boxcars were then loaded by dropping down a downspout afterwards. Over here to the left is another building that's been gone for a long time, and at that time that was called the Pippin Pickle Processing Plant. It was owned by a company from Winona. You'll notice that there's a lot less buildings built up anywhere here. You know, Cochrane's pretty sparsely built up, but still substantially along the way. Another aerial view now. This one's from the other side, and it's looking toward the bluffs and gives us a good perspective of Cochrane back at that time. You can see the uh, uh, school grounds. You can see the ballpark there, the old school grounds and the old ballpark. The, now these would have been taken by planes and they probably would have been taken probably, I would guess, you know, in the late 30s and early 40s. And that made me think a little bit about the airplanes and the uh, big sport when we were going to school down in this area down here was once in a while a barnstorming pilot would come to Cochrane. And it would be Max Conrad or it could be other persons with uh, little small uh, monoplanes usually, sometimes a biplane. 
And they'd buzz, they'd buzz these little communities like Cochrane. They'd fly back and forth over them a few times. Then they'd land in a, in a flat field, and they used to land right down in this area here when they could stop at Cochrane. And if you had enough money, they'd take you up and give you an airplane ride. And I remember my first airplane ride was at the age of 10, and uh, it was with Max Conrad in a two-seat open plane, and it was a monoplane. Another uh, early pilot in Cochrane was uh, uh, a fellow named Hanson, Willard Hanson. He was registered of deeds for a number of years, and uh, right downtown in the center of town here, he had his airplane hangar. Then, of course, another famous pilot in our area was Mel Freed from Fountain City, which I'm sure is a name that rings a bell with a lot of you folks. And he, he flew the first mail plane that regularly went back and forth over this particular route between the cities and Chicago. And Mel Freed would always dip his wings and, uh, and make a little bit of a, uh, an indication when he went by the village of Cochrane, and people would go out there and they'd, they'd wave and they'd say, there goes Mel Freed. That was the mail going to Minneapolis. Another picture then of uh, Cochrane from the southwest end of town. This is a view that you're never going to very rarely see from the outside of the field. You can uh, look over there. Here's the uh, Lutheran Church, for instance, and it uh, shows that there's all kinds of buildings that were built up over in this side that aren't there back at that time. Now those are all general pictures of Cochrane. Now we're going to get a little more specific. We're going to take a little walk through town. And we're going to start right down in the center of the loop. And that's 5th and Main. So here's how 5th and Main looked in 1886 to 88, something like that. Here we are with, let's see, my two pictures. Yeah. Here we are. The first building built in Cochrane was the Hofer Hotel. And that's right there. And that's the bowling alley today. That's the alley cat right there. Uh, where the bowling alley is was a dance hall extension. And uh, that building was built in 1886. And the building right across the street was built right after it, also in 1886. And that's where Rudy's Red Owl is today. And at that time, it was the Roar Brothers uh, store. So um, you can see all mud streets. Uh, I think mud's the right word instead of dirt, isn't it? And uh, here you can see this is the road going up past, uh, going up to where the uh, highway is. And uh, let's see, I think we've got some better pictures coming up that show more detail of other places in the area. But you'll notice that I point out the Hofer Hotel here, it shows hotel and saloon. And then it's a little hard to read up in here, but on the enlarged pictures we can see it says Hofer's 1886. Now this is just a little bit later. In fact, we know this is after 1911 because the store that I showed you on the left, the, the Roar Brothers store, we gotta get back here, okay. The Roar Brothers store on the, on the left over here, that was wood frame building, you remember when we looked at the last picture. In 1911, that wood frame building burned down and they built this brick one. So this would have been sometime after 1911, but you can see that it's not clogged up with downtown car parking by any means. You can see we're still back strictly in the days of horse and buggy, so it's probably around a 1915 uh, picture, something like that. Now this next one here is a picture I really love. And this is in front of the alley cat. This is in front of Hofer's um, uh, hotel and saloon. And this, you know, we say we didn't have any deer hunting here 25 years ago or more. And uh, back, in, back in the 1880s, there were deer and they were hunting them, quite obviously, because you can see them out here. And this is the Hofer Hotel right there at that uh, corner door where everybody can go in. And it shows, um, well, the hotel, first of all, 
was um, built by J.B. Hofer, and J.B. Hofer is a fellow here that's right here on the left-hand side, and one of the very, very first settlers, and one that built the first building in the town here. And uh, the fellow on the right here, just over here on the right there, is uh, Charles Hoover. He was the son-in-law of J.B. Hofer. And Charles Hoover and his wife Lily, they operated this Hofer Hotel. He was one of the persons that organized the first bank here, the Farmers and Merchants Bank. And uh, uh, Charles and the Albert Hoover, uh, the Charles that's on the picture here, you're right, and his, and his brother, are also the ones that operated the Buffalo Farm up on the top of the bluff. And we know that this picture would be before 1913 because uh, Charles died in 1913 at a very young age of 46. Now, you remember I said that the, the old Roar Brothers store burned down and this is the way it looked in 1886 and for the period of time up to 1911. The, um, that we took, we've got this off an old postcard, great picture because it's got all the buggies parked along the side here and uh, it shows that the, they had dry goods and clothing and then over there where the hardware store is now, the hardware store was there then at that time. The, uh, the two brothers kind of divided up the business between the two of them, the two Roar brothers. And on the back of the postcard that we've got in the Historical Society collection, it says, this is a great trading place. Have you been there lately? I got my winter hat here, so you can guess what a swell affair it is. <laughs> now this home, or this building was built in 1911, and it burned, I mean, was uh, built in 1886. But it burned down in 1911. A lightning bolt struck the building, and there was a great fire as far as uh, the early history of Cochrane is concerned. Uh, the fire started at 9.45 in the evening, according to our paper, and uh, the local firemen all turned out, and the only firefighting system they had in Cochrane at that time was a four-man pump with a lever that would go back and forth like that, two men on each side going like that and just suction pumping out of a tank and they were using that to try to quell the fire and but they were they had bucket lines running to keep pouring water into the bucket and they were get, getting uh, water out of a um, muddy area there in a nearby ditch and the pumper, pumper eventually plugged up with the mud and the store completely burned but the Roar Brothers had full insurance on the you know, building and the contents and they turned right around and they started to rebuild and they rebuilt the brick structure that Rudy works in today, Rudy and Elaine. And the building burned down in, uh, in early 1911, well, um, June 1911, and they had the grand opening of the new store already by the fall season of 1911. And there's that new building, back in the really early history of it. Back, you can see down there in the bottom of the postcard, this is the daylight store. And at that time they had uh, open skylights. I can still remember them being there as a boy. They had open skylights in the uh, ceiling. And uh, that was their main source of lighting there. So they call it the daylight store. Another great picture here with the really early car out in front of it. Now the next one we've got shows the inside of the Daylight Store. And here we've got the inside of the Daylight Store, the Roar General Store interior. And we know that the um, two fellas that are over there on the uh, right hand side of your picture, and that's Frank Auer on the left, and the shorter one is Ray Gettinger. Now we're getting up so you can practically recognize the place, can't you? And now we're up to the time when it became the Speed and Wrestler 
store. When the Roar, Roar Brothers uh, left that business, it was taken over by Kermit Speed and Bill Ressler, and they operated the store for a number of years and were the persons that sold it to Rudy Zeller. And at that time, over there on the right-hand side, uh, J.L. Roar, one of the Roar Brothers, is the one that um, was in the hardware store. Uh, but by this time here, it probably would have been Emil Florine, which would have been in the hardware store at that time, in the hardware and the undertaking business. Should we all stand up and cheer, Rudy? This is it. <laughs> so this gets us up to Rudy's Red Owl. And you know, we're talking as if Rudy's is recent history, but... Uh, Hey, uh, Rudy's been in business here. Rudy and Elaine have been in business here now since 1954. So they got 51 years in business here on this corner themselves already. Now, just to let you know, that's not the only corner in town. <laughs> this is uh, looking out and looking... Let's see, I'm just trying to place this one myself right now. This is looking north from there, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You notice at that time we were having, we had board sidewalks, there were no concrete sidewalks, no, no paved roads, nothing of that nature there. Trees were all small. Now this is over at the other corner, looking to the south. This is where the, um, where the, Alliance Bank Park is right now, on the opposite side uh, to the south from Rudy's Red Hall. And back in those earlier years, it was Ferd Hansen's farm implement and post office when this particular picture was taken. And the, um, the signs that uh, we can read here on this uh, show post office and um, they also show Ferdinand Hansen, United States Cream Separators. The sign over the door reads Ferd Hansen, Dealer in Livestock and Farm Implements. And you remember I was talking about pilots? Uh, uh, Ferd's son Willard uh, was uh, one of the early pilots and he kept his plane in a shed in the back here. That was Hooley Hansen as far as the people that remember everybody by the old names. Now, this is the house that used to be where the present Alliance Bank building is. And that was the, that was the home. And isn't it quite a large and grand home? That was the, the Roar Brothers house. That's the Roar Brothers that were running the store where Rudy's is now. And that was J.L. Roar and G.M. Roar. And the right-hand side of the house was built first as the J.L. Roar House that was built in 1893. And uh, right after that, within a couple of years, G.M. Roar built a house and they just attached it together. This was, this was brotherly love, wasn't it? And obviously, they got along well with each other's in-laws. And they had a double residence for the brothers. And there must have been a, a, a gala time when this particular picture was taken because it must have been the Roar family reunion, don't you think? Because just look at the people lined up here on the upper porch and look at the people lined up down here on the bottom. And you'll notice that um, uh, they were, the city was just still not spending a lot of money on street and uh, sidewalk maintenance. Then um, this is a picture of the Achenbach drugstore in the interior. And the Achenbach drugstore would have been where the Ferd Hansen place had been on the corner and where the park area is now. And uh, Howard and Elna came here and opened this drugstore in 1936, first drugstore we had in town. Uh, Emmett Miley, the doctor, had been here just a couple of years before that. And they remodeled this particular building and at that time uh, it was no longer, it, what, what, it, what it was was at that time it was Annie Bastier's Blue Moon Tavern if any of you can remember Annie Bastier and the Blue Moon Tavern. And they remodeled the Blue Moon Tavern and they put a doctor's office on the south side of it 
and that's where Emmett Miley then moved into. We'll show a picture of the house where he was prior to that time as well. And um, Howard and Elna had living quarters upstairs where they lived until the time that they retired from that business there. Uh, again, opened in 1936. Now this is the, uh, the the church that's presently where the or that used to be or just until just a few years ago, where the um, uh, full gospel assembly church is now, where the new church is that they built. It was originally called the EUB Church, Evangelical United Brethren, and uh, uh, sat right in the location of where the new church was. It was um, it was uh, when the new church was built. It was moved around to the back of the uh, of the full gospel church and uh, is still being used as a, I believe, I'm not sure if they're using it, they were using it as a Sunday school uh, building, and I, I think they're still using it for storage and special purposes, but they thought enough of it because of it, it because it was built by an ancestor of uh, the um, uh, people in, in the church today that uh, they've took care of it, preserved it nicely, and uh, moved it directly behind the old church, or the new church. Here we are, Main Street in Cochrane, and uh, this is from just a little bit uh, south of the um, uh, Fifth and Main corner. You can see the uh, the Hofer uh, ta Tavern and Saloon. And the hotel is right over here again. Here's uh, the Red Owl building. You'll notice this is in brick construction now, so it's at some time after 1911, but certainly not long after it. Uh, over here is where this Ferd Hansen building would have been. And over here is one that you haven't seen a picture of yet. And uh, what that actually is at that particular time, uh, we're going to show you a couple of pictures of. And it, it was a, uh, a, a, also a... Um, well, I think at this particular time, I think it was the Lonsman building. The Lonsman was the first newspaper published in, uh, in this area here. It was a German-language newspaper published there. The, uh, we're going to get a better picture of the uh, higher saddle, saddle and uh, harness shop, which is right next to it. Again, don't you like those streets, you know, the grass grows right out into everywhere except right down the main level. Okay, this is the Wettis Willer Saloon. I, and I couldn't ever remember having ever heard of this name when we first ran into that. But uh, that was located at the corner of 5th and Main, and it's uh, where the old Farmers and Merchants Bank used to be, where Mike Chambers' office is now. That's where that building was. And the uh, building was being used as a saloon at that time, so it would have been right across from the Hofer Saloon. So people wouldn't have to walk too far, you know, they just, but they did have to cross the busy street, you know. The, uh, a little bit later, the building gets turned into this newspaper publishing office, the Landsman office. Now, this is, this is a great picture here, too, because um, if you take a look at it here, you may say, who took a lot of these early pictures? And most of these really early pictures we have are no doubt taken by this gentleman right here. And his name was Florian Reedy. He was the first photographer. He actually had a photography business. He was the first photographer in, in Cocker. And then um, right next to there, the person in the middle is Leonard Herman, who was the bartender. And Philip Woltz, W-O-L-T-Z, who was the barber. And this was also a barber shop. You could get clipped in more ways than one while you were, when you went into the Wheaters Willer Saloon here, you know. And you could, you could arrange to have your picture taken as well. Though Reedy's office actually was across the street and um, uh, over at, um, uh, next to Ferd Hansen's shop is where Reedy's. We got another great picture of uh, uh, 
of, of them sitting out in front of the place across the street, and Florian Reedy is sitting over there. He's got a picnic bottle tipped up like this at the time. I mean, he probably got that across the street here at the Weeders with our saloon. This is the same building again. Now it's the Lonsman. Now it's been turned into the newspaper office. And uh, we um, figure this building, uh, this picture would have been before 1916 because it's before the Lonsman building was moved. This, this building moved around town uh, quite a bit, actually. Uh, in 1916's when they uh, built the uh, first bank building there, the Farmers and Merchants Bank building, the building that Mike Chambers is in now. And uh, then they moved this building at that time. So we know this picture would have been before 1916. Notice again those great board, uh, board sidewalks. Again, we uh, aren't too sure of the persons that we can see on the picture out here. But no doubt people that were connected with the publishing office there. Uh, one of the first editors of the Lonsman was a, a great uncle of mine named uh, John F. Schlostein. And, uh, but I, I don't think that John F. is on there because he was considerably portly and very easy to spot. Well, let's see, I just want to go back there. I just noticed something just before there. Okay, Kelly, what's going on here now? Where's the bottom button? Bottom button. To get rid of the menu, huh? Then, yeah, then try it. I tried pushing the bottom button. <laughs> okay, now the Lonsman building. Uh, if you're looking right down the main street, if you look to the right of the Lonsman building, you see where it says harness shop? That's our next building. And there it is, the R.C. Hire uh, Harness and Saddlery Building. Look at all familiar, Mr. Dworshik? <laughs> this is Dallas's place, too. And the next picture is the way it looks now today. But this is the way it looked back at that time. Again, uh, uh, streets aren't developed, aren't finished off at all. And notice how close the in, in appearance the building is, just modified as far as the exterior siding is concerned. Now, looking up toward the railroad tracks. Let's see, did I miss one here? Yeah. Looking up toward the railroad tracks. And this is another view and again, I think all these were probably Florian Reedy pictures, though we don't have any way of knowing for sure. And they all showed up on early postcards that we've managed to get a hold of and find. You can notice now, you can just see a little bit of the Lonsman building over on the right-hand side. And uh, incidentally, the Lonsman building, when it got moved, it uh, went up to the 6th and Main. That's where the barber shop is now. That is the Lonsman building. That is the building that used to be the Weedas Willer Saloon. Now, going just a little bit farther up that same street then, going up a little bit more toward the railroad track. This is Laverne Eichamp's um, uh, garage area. And back earlier, it was the Bollinger Livery and Dray. And it was really quite a business back in those early years when the uh, Dray lines would meet the railroad and pick up supplies and take them down to the merchant's shops. And, uh, this, uh, and this shows um, the... Dre line, and we know quite a few of the people on here. First person on the left, we don't know, but we know that the next one on the left is Norman Bollinger, and George Bollinger, and Joe Solway, Jr., Frank Keller, Joe Solway, Sr., Lance Sotavasser, and Louis Bollinger. So that's person on the right is Louis, and the person whose place this was. And back in those earlier years, the livery kept up to 20 horses 
on hand at all times, and they used them for cream collection and for local hauling. Then if we went up just a little bit farther up the road, okay, um, now I think you folks can remember which one this is. And if we go right past the depot, which is the one I thought was coming up next, but go right past the depot and we go across the railroad tracks, we got to the old village hall. And of course, when the, um, when the, uh, when the highway was put in, the village hall was just on the other side of the highway when Highway 35 was, but it still stayed there until La Crosse Milling widened out, or until the state for a while, La Crosse Milling, just a few years back, widened out that whole area and took all the houses and buildings that were on the other side of the road there. And that meant that the old village hall had to be uh, destroyed or moved. And uh, through, the, through the work of the, your local historical society and with a, a lot of credit to Dallas, this building was saved and was moved and is now where you frequently have your meetings and this shows how it looks here today. And I think that this is just a tremendous example of saving a great old building. This is where all the old village uh, hall meetings were at. Uh, shortly after I came back here and started practicing law, I was on the, on the village board for a while. And uh, I can remember going to village board meetings in this building. They were being held there at that time yet. And it's uh, just great to see it well preserved. Now this was also, of course, the water pumping station. Now when was this building built? It was built in 1911. What does 1911 mean to Cochran? That's when the big Roar Brothers store fire took place. That's when they ran out of water and it burned to the ground, you know. So, those of you that are familiar with the village hall know that the pumping station is in the back and underneath that building. The, uh, the old well was there. And in 1912, they bonded the village of Cochrane and they built the well. And uh, uh, so the village hall building was no doubt built also to house the, old, the new water system for Cochrane. Then we get up to the depot. And this shows the depot back in the early years. And the depot was just a tremendously important thing as far as the early history of Cochrane was concerned. Uh, we didn't have 40, 50 trains a day going through like we have now, you know. Uh, uh, but there was a, a passenger train that came down in the morning and a passenger train that went back in the afternoon. It was actually used by a lot of people for transportation. It was the main method of transportation if anybody was going any distance. And uh, all kinds of uh, uh, things that you or UPS truck didn't drive up to your door, you know. FedEx wasn't around. Everything came to the depot. So everybody would go to the depot on a regular basis here. And uh, this shows the Cochrane Depot. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know who any of these people are either. So if any of you do know who they are, let Kelly know over there. Anybody can spot any of them right now? This shows, uh, there, therefore, then, how that old railroad station looked. And, uh, oh, there's a lot, a lot of great stories that I can think of about the, what, what used to happen up around the old railroad station here. I used to spend a lot of time uh, playing up here. Cochran had extra siding along this area and uh, Elmo was too narrow for it, Fountain City was too narrow for it, so an awful lot of the switching and that type of thing was done here in Cochran. The, um, and uh, as a childhood thing, uh, kids, the kids would come up there and we'd watch the trains uh, uh, switch and change and the engineers would get to know us and once in a while, if you were really lucky, you know, they'd go like this, you know, and you'd run up there and you'd climb up into the cab of the engine along with the engineer and switch back and forth and felt like you were really important. You can imagine what the modern day safety rules and things would say about something like that. And uh, those were, of course, early steam engines that were going through in the earlier years and uh, until the, until the very exciting day when the Zephyr first came through in the late 1930s. Now, one of the main things that, uh, you know, if you wanted to go traveling, you had to go up and you had to wait for the train. And uh, here's Herman Body waiting on the Cochran Depot platform for the train. We don't know what, it, what year it was. We don't know how long he's been waiting. We don't know how long it took for the train to get there. 
but there's Herman Body because it was written on the back of the car. Herman Body waiting for the train. <laughs> uh, I'm sure a lot of you remember about uh, how the mail got delivered in those days, you know, when the, when the mail train came through, uh, uh, they didn't necessarily stop. And they had this uh, arm that would stand out from, the, uh, from a post along the railroad track, kind of a catcher arm like that. And uh, then uh, they'd just hold the mail bag out, you know, and it would catch onto the hook, you know, and they would swing there. And then Barney Mulek would come up with his little push cart, you know, and load up the mail and take it down to the post office. Um, they, they were still getting mail like that when I went into service in, uh, in late World War II time. And uh, I used to tell my buddies from Brooklyn and people in areas like that about how we used to get the mail there, and that used to really blow them away. You know? And they said, what did you call it? I'd always tell them we call it air mail, you know. That, that's, sometimes the planes would deliver it the same way, you know. <laughs> Just swoop down and drop it off on the hook. Now, you had to take care of the railroad, and it was a, there, in every town along the way, they had a section group. And those groups took care of a section of area for the railroad. And they were all local people and everybody in town uh, would know who those general people were because they were all local people working there. And this shows a picture of the section hand group that worked out of Cochrane. And this is 1924. We know what their pay was at that particular time. They were getting $2.72 an hour for an eight-hour day. A little later, that in the, a little later than that, in the heart of depression, the section hand crew went down to a dollar a day, 12 and a half cents an hour. Uh, used to be, I used to stop at Ferd Huber's house a lot because Harold Hetrick and I were great buddies in those years. And uh, Ferd would tell us about how he used to work at, for, at the section for a dollar a day during the depression. Anyway, back at this time, they were getting $2.72. The 20s were going pretty good in 1924. Now, who are these people here? From the left to the right, we got Otto Monk, Andrew Souter. Next one is the one sitting down right there in the middle there. That's George Friedrich. Now, a lot of you probably remember George, and everybody who went to school back in my area remembers George. He was our great janitor locally. And his house was uh, between our house and the school, and it was only about, uh, his house was about a block away and our house was about two blocks away. But when I was a little kid, I couldn't make it all the way without a drink along the way, you know. So I'd always have to stop at George Friedrich's house. In the back porch, he had a pitcher pump, and there always used to be a dipper there in a pail, and that's where I could always stop and get water along the way. Anyway, George was just a great friend to all the young people in town. Then uh, just to the right of George uh, Friedrich there. Leonard Letha and Chris Schweitzer, he was the foreman. Frank Soss, Fritz Burmeister, and Norman Harold. This is what's really great when we can actually identify some of these early pictures. And one of the things that is getting done up in the historical office is uh, cataloging all these pictures on our computer system and working, and this is what Kelly is uh, really gifted in and what he's really working on, in a way that we'll be able to plug in all the names into the computer system so that we can search them when you stop up at the Buffalo County uh, Courthouse at the historical office, you'd be able to put down George Friedrich, we'll be able to tell you what postcard he appears on, what newspaper article he's in, what lot he was buried in, we'll try by getting all the different records together like that. So any information that you can help us put in will help us in getting that done. Here we've got the old Cochrane Mill, and this is the mill before the fire that burned it down. And this shows it uh, in the earlier years, before the La Crosse Milling Company uh, came in and developed it, and uh, shows a railroad work train on this side. We had a real difficult time trying to find a picture of the old Cochrane Mill. This picture here shows a, bringing a load of grain up to the Cochrane elevator. And uh, obviously in the winter time, and bringing the load of grain up there. And we know that the fellow who's on the, on the wagon here again, because somebody was nice enough to ride it on the back of the car, is uh, William Giltzel.
This shows how the milling company, of course, looks today. And uh, the milling company got established here in um, 1946. That's when Jay Martin came to town and uh, bought the old, uh, the old mill and uh, started to developing the La Crosse Milling Company. Then went to various uh, changes and expansions over the years up to the present time. Uh, the original uh, building that uh, was the first mill that Jay Martin was operating burned down in 1956. That was the second big fire in the history of Cochrane. And uh, is, um, was, well, I guess the third one, because the Ford Garage would have been the second one but uh, was a, a fire that uh, carried sparks and debris all over the entire uh, village of Cochrane back at that time. I can, um, uh, let's see, I've got down here, yeah, 1956, yeah. And then the mill, of course, was rebuilt in 1957. And this, this is probably a picture shortly after that period of time. Now, we're gonna leave the center of town and we got to go either north or south, and we're going to start with north. This is going up the street a bit and looking back toward 5th and Main. And the hotel over on the right-hand side is what, the one that used to be the William Bollinger Hotel. And uh, at that time, well, originally it was built as the Kyle Holtz Hotel, but most of the years, in the early years that it was in operation, it was owned by Bill Bollinger. And um, that was built in 1914, that particular building was built. Uh, if, we, if you look at the picture here now, uh, Fifth and Main is back in here. You know, here's the, uh, the hotel, here's Rudy's, here's the bank building. So um, this picture, was probably taken shortly after sometime 17, 1917 or 18 because the bank building was built in 16 back here. <coughs> and uh, then across the street there, that's August Monk's Meat Market. And we've got a couple more pictures coming up about that. And uh, quite a bit of things happened right around this 1916 period. The Bollinger Hotel was built, the meat market was built in 1916. Uh, the Cochrane Motor and Supply Company, that's what everybody used to later call the Ford Garage, was built in 1914. And uh, is the building that, um, is right, was the building where the car is standing. Right there. And August Monk's building would have been right up about, right past there. No, this would have been the, this would have been the Ford Garage. That's August Monk's building. The interior of Bill Bollinger's saloon. Kind of tell you a quick little story about Bill Bollinger's saloon. See, that was just sort of cattywampus across the street from my grandpa's house. And when I was a little boy, I used to sometimes spend a little time over at my grandpa's house. And uh, once in a while, he'd, he'd go across the street to get a cold one, you know. And then he'd bring me along if he was stuck with me at that time. And we'd go into this place here, and it looked just like this because they've never changed the interior on the building. And the, you'd, sit, you know, you'd sit up to the bar stools there, and they'd set me up to the bar stool there. And then they'd tell me, now, if you can... Then at first they'd spit on a penny, you know, and then they'd stick it on my forehead. And they said, now, if you can keep that penny on your forehead there for ten minutes without falling off, we'll get you a beer. Uh, so I'd stay there and I'd sort of hold my head up like that so the penny wouldn't fall off, you know, and I'd keep quiet as a mouse like that. I always remember I always stared at this advertising picture up there which was a picture of John L. Sullivan, the old bare knuckle boxer, was up there advertising silver dollar whiskey. And then at the end of that period of time, at that time they served the beer in these big old-fashioned husky mugs, you know. And then at the end of that time, if uh, I'd remind them if the 10 minutes up yet, you know. And Oh yeah, okay. And then Bill Bollinger would go over there, and you remember those little bitty root beer mugs that they used to have, about an inch and a half tall? Bill would go over there and he'd draw beer for me in one of those and said he'd send it out there with them. Anyway, this is the interior of the old Bollinger Saloon. 
and we know who they are. And there's some significant names in the history of Car Cochran here. The um, uh, fellow behind the bar there, he's the, um, that's not Bill Bollinger, but uh, he was the um, uh, person that was uh, the operating the bar at that time, and that's Eddie Knuspe. And then the fellow right here on the left, that's August Monk, Butch Monk. Next one over, William Feast. The next one over is Herman Zeichert. Did a lot of building of rock work in our area. And the last one on the right, a name that's very familiar to Buffalo City, Charlie Roebuck. And the bar in the back bar, same as they are right now today. <laughs> we we got to get into a little bit of uh, later humor. This is not too late, though, you know, it's uh, probably around the 1950s, uh, somewhere in that area. It might have been a little earlier. Um, they used to have Bill Bollinger's um, place. They used to have a stage there, and they'd put on community plays and things of that nature there. And one of the things that they had was what they called the baby review one year. And... Uh, uh, the two on the left here are Butt and Jeff. <laughs> one on the left, that's Alan Baszler. One on the right is Louis Yankford Jr. <laughs> and, and the story was is that Louis was uh, pretty concerned because uh, he had pudding under, under his hat there and he was afraid Alan was going to squash it on him before they would use it at the right time in the play. Now going over to, I remember where the, uh, where the Monk building is? Uh, this is the way it looked originally. This is the old meat market building, just a frame building that was there. And uh, you'll see that the building just to the left of it is the bank and post office building. This is the right hand side of the building, the Oliver and Andy part of the building. And that's where August Monk first started his um, uh, meat market there. And when he um, built the building, he saw, when he built the new building, after he moved into the new building, which was built just to the right of this place here, uh, then he sold this building. It got moved downtown somewhere, but we don't know where it went. All we knew is it got moved somewhere toward the other end of Cochran, toward the south end, and it's somebody's house today. But unfortunately, we don't know whose house it is, so if anybody can clue us in, please help us. The... Um, Shows some people out here in the uh, in the front of it, and the uh, the man that's over there on the left hand side is Ray Gettinger. And uh, now you might want to know who the horses are. We even sometimes we even get things identified that we really don't expect. That's Maud and Tom. The two horses are. Uh, then uh, you see, you see sleeping up there on the seat there where the driver would be. That's the dog, and his name is Jack. <laughs> and we know that because it was all written on the back of the car. Well, after he built the new meat market, this is a picture of the new meat market interior. And uh, he built it in 1915. This shows Butch Monk on the right-hand side there. And um, the fellow there on the left, I'm pretty sure is Rob Roy Henry, but uh, we're not positive on that identification. There, by zooming in, and one of the advantages of some of the equipment we've got at the courthouse and Kelly's abilities on them, is we're able to zoom in on some of these early pictures. Incidentally, if any of you have great early pictures, we can just take that picture and without harming it a bit, we can um, uh, digitally copy it on a scanner, return it to you. We can have it permanently in our records at that time. And if we do need to do so research-wise, we can zoom in on certain areas of it and try to see what things read. In this kind of pictures, a lot of times we figure out the dates on them by hopefully reading calendars that are on the wall. And uh, in this particular one here, the calendar that's up on the wall shows September 1930.
And this shows the meat market somewhat later. And uh, for a while, of course, it became the, uh, the store building that the um, uh, IGA store originally was in, that uh, Lamo had. And of course, then later was uh, converted into apartments when uh, Howard Monk uh, uh, inherited the building and uh, converted its usages after there was no longer being used as a grocery store. Let's see. I don't think I've got my notes on in order on this one here. But this is the this is the interior of the meat market. Somewhat later, we've got um, uh, Butch Monk on the left again, and I'm not sure who they, who we have on the right hand side. Here's a building that practically no one remembers even existing, and uh, shortly after 18 after the buildings were built downtown and on the same location as the Ford garage later was and the post office is now, there was a, uh, a business there and at one end of that business was the Cochrane Jewelry Company. And uh, again, I've got some notes on that, but um, we must have them out of order. Give me just a second to check. We got enough slides. We're not going to run out anyway. I'm sure you know. Anyway, um, uh, I'm just trying to remember the name of the people that uh, had this store, and uh, but they're not people that are familiar to our area anymore at all. But they, this was when Cochran had a jewelry store, and this shows the interior of that, selling clocks and jewelry. A store that um, also did burn down very early in Cochrane's history and was never uh, replaced. Yes, right in the post office area. Mm -hmm. Now this shows the construction of the Ford Garage, and um, that I do have. Let's see, I just found my note on that prior one there, the Cochrane Jewelry Company. That was Otto Radisky, Otto Radisky, and it was the Beneke department store. And that Beneke building was destroyed by fire sometime, then it, became, then it was vacant for a number of years until the Ford garage was built there. The, um, So then along came the time when they were going to build a Ford garage in Cochrane, and that was uh, right after E.H. had um, uh, gone into the garage business a short time and was some new competition as far as E.H. Uh, was concerned. Anyway, the Ford garage was built, and this would have been on the corner where the post office is today. And this shows them breaking the ground for it. This is one of those great pictures that we have that identifies every single person on this picture from children to adults and everybody else. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through them all, but it includes some names uh, like um, uh, Herman Fink, and to me, as a young boy, uh, all I ever knew him by and all everybody called him was High Pockets. So if I'm, some of you remember High Pockets, that's Herman Fink, and he's one of the persons that's on that picture here. Some of the children that are on there include uh, Pearl Cockendeffer and Dora Cockendeffer, and, um, as just little children here on the pictures that are, that's up here. This shows the the uh, garage after it was really going along. It shows that uh, before um, the It was built in 1914. 
and um, the people are identified again. Uh, the man on the left is Art Gerson. He's indicated to be a bluff siding mechanic. Next one over is Henry Cockendorf. Henry Cockendorf was the primary person behind the building of that uh, garage and you know, the ownership and management of it. Next one over is Joe Fisher, a Fountain City businessman that was up here for the grand opening. Uh, Bob Robinson, a mechanic from, it just simply said, a mechanic from the south. And in the car, in the front, is August Gantz, who was, of course, from Cochrane. And in the background is John Yeager. Some of the interesting things to notice when you kind of zoom in on this picture is they were selling Red Crown gasoline. That's the gasoline pump that you see there. And uh, do you see the street light over there in the corner? Right there in the corner of the building is a post with a street light on there. That's a Dietz gas kerosene light, and that's where the original uh, Cochrane street lights. Oh, and the, uh, the cars are indicated to be in order of left to right, a Ford, a Buick, and a Ford. I don't know how one, one of Alfred's, Roar's uh, Buicks got mixed into the Ford garage picture, but he probably, probably parked it there for the day. <laughs> and of course, this building later burned down and then was vacant for many years and just sort of in ruins until the post office was built there. All right, now we're moving up the street a little bit more. Now we're moving up to the other end of the block. Now the post office is just to our right, out of the picture, uh, where we, we're probably standing right in front of uh, the hotel on our left and the post office on our right, and we're looking up the street from there. And you can see the uh, big home that's over there on the right-hand side that's still there today. The a um, little farther down the street there, uh, you can see what is it was the Alfred Rohr house. Uh, the house that's over here in the corner was moved when the Lonsman building was brought down there. So this would have been before that app, before that was moved. This house here is um, the second house up on that block on the right. This is the uh, large home that's on the corner, just on the right-hand side. The uh, house there, the second house up there, is the house that um, uh, my grandfather, Fritz Schlustein, uh, lived in. And that's the, uh, the Loretta Hess house today. And uh, incidentally, there were only two owners of that house in its entire lifetime. It was one of the very first homes built in Cochrane and uh, was lived in by my grandfather for many, many years until they sold it to the Hesses, and the Hesses lived in it for over 50 years as well. The house just to the left of it that you can just barely see is the blue house. It's the next one up the line, the house where I was raised in, and where my folks, uh, Bell and Bridge Schlustein, lived. And that actually went, it was originally the John Schlustein house, and the next picture shows that. And what's significant about that house is we saw the first buildings built in Cochrane, right down there in the corner, the business buildings. This was the first home, the first residence that was built in the village of Cochrane, and uh, is that John Schlustein house. And again, like I say, the house that I was raised in after it had been gone through a few changes along the line. Uh, this shows John and Mary Schlustein and their first child, Mabel. And we know that Mabel was born in 1890. So, She's pretty tiny there, so this is a really early picture. It can't be more than 91 or 92 that the picture was taken in. This would have been the kind of picture that would have been taken by the old-time traveling photographers. They like to take pictures of people with their children in front of their, their homes or their farmsteads or things like that. Now, um, the Farmer's Telephone Company came along in uh, 1905, one of the really early telephone companies to get established, one of the few telephone companies that's, that's remained an independent company all these years. And it started in 1905. It served Cochran, Buffalo City, and the rural area out toward Wamandy. And the first lineman for the uh, 
Cochrane Telephone Company was this John Schlustein that you just saw in the previous picture there. And he uh, built the original lines, installed the phones and so on. And he was the business manager and he got $30 a month for that. Uh, the first central telephone switchboard in the village of Cochrane was in this John Schlustein house, the house that you just saw just before. And it was right there in the front room. This is, if you're familiar with that house now, there's a bay window right there where the, uh, where the windows are. And um, that's where the telephone switchboard was for a number of years. It remained there until 1919. As many of you may remember where it got moved to, the upstairs of the old Farmers and Merchants Bank building, up there at the top of the steps that goes back up there past the old Fifth Avenue bar uh, between the buildings there. I went up to the second floor and that's where it was for many, many years. My Aunt May was the uh, person that ran the switchboard up there for many, many years. This picture we figure was taken about 1910. Would have been in the old, while well, I was still in the John Schlustein house, would have been John's daughter Mabel, who was the first full-time operator of the Cochrane Telephone Company. At one time, Cochrane had a basket factory. They thought they were really going to go places with the basket factory. The basket factory was over in the area where the, uh, uh, would have been directly across the street from the houses that I'd just been talking about. And uh, it, uh, it never got very far, though, because after it had been operating for just a couple of years, uh, a big uh, tornado came through Cochrane. It's supposed to be the only tornado that ever actually came through Cochrane. It uh, hit the basket factory pretty hard and uh, the basket factory never reopened. It sh shows the ruins right after it. Now let's move over a little bit to the left of the corner to Rich's Barbershop area. That's the Lonsman building. And this shows the inti inside of the Lonsman building after it was moved up there and after it was no longer a newspaper building. It, uh, at this time it was Louis Schmidt's tobacco shop. Does that ring a bell, Elaine? <laughs> it's e it even had gas pumps in the front and uh, pictured in here on the left Louis Schmidt on the left Roscoe Hanson and Herman Body Herman Body was the one you remember that was reading, waiting for the railroad station to, up there for the train to come Now this next uh, picture here, we put in here because that's Dr. Bailitz. And that's the Rohr house, Alfred Rohr's house, just behind there. So this is where, about where Dr. Bailitz's house later would have been. And uh, uh, this is probably where he lived back at that particular time. He was the first full-time doctor in Cochrane. and was a doctor here in Cochrane for many, many years. Obviously he made house calls. Because you can see he's ready to go out here in the winter time with the sleigh. Now we're going to get into some of the A.H. Rohr history. Listen up, Burl. <laughs> uh, this shows the A.H. Rohr home very early, uh, shortly after a shipment of cars had come in. And uh, this is before the garage building was built. If you notice, just to the right, where the brick building is that the garage was for so many years, that's not there yet. This was um, when he only had a large merchandise shed just to the farther north of that, the shed of which is now joins the brick building. And this shows the lineup of cars that he had in there, and I'm sure it was the biggest thing in town at that particular time as far as getting out and seeing the cars. <coughs> This shows the original E. A. Troar buildings. And this is all the merchandise sheds that are on the upper end of the uh, area yet. You'll notice now there's only a wood building there where the brick building was later built. But it shows E. A. Troar implement shed before the building of that uh, brick car, car dealership building. And if you zoom in on the signs up here, you'll notice they advertise flour. It was in and he was selling all of these things, flour, feed salt, binder twine, fence wire, nails, pumps, all these things were being advertised on the outside of the building. Asphalt, roofing and repair, buggies, 
wagons, farm machinery, signs along the roof include D. Lavelle separators and John Deere. Uh, you note again the two uh, real early cars that are shown in the picture on the uh, right hand side. And there's an interstate fair ad up there. And it showed the uh, dates of September 22 to 26 and we checked those out and they would have fallen right for 1913. So this is when this picture would have been taken. This is the front of the garage, probably not long after it was built, uh, probably very shortly after it was built, and uh, shows the people that were operating the H. Roar garage in the early years. And the fellow on the left there is um, Art Poncho, the little guy, that's Milt Roar. A.H. Roar is the next one that's standing there. And the fellow on the right is Ray Zerzo. And Ray Zerzo was a mechanic that uh, worked for Alfred Roar for in excess of 50 years for him. Then uh, just looking across the street a bit from there, I and mean, this is... Um, uh, standing out in the middle of the block, but looking on the opposite side from the Roar Garage, looking over toward where the uh, uh, where Judy and Jeans is now, the uh, building that's on the right-hand side that you see that looks like a store building there, that was first built around 1900 by Henry Cockendorfer, and he opened a general store there. And uh, originally, it was on the uh, right-hand side of that, uh, that lot there, right next to the Hummer House, and um, vacant on the left. Then uh, Henry ran the, uh, the store by himself for a short time. Then he took in Alfred Rohr, who had come to town. And for a couple of years, Alfred Rohr and Henry Cockendorfer ran this general store together. They, we figured out that they probably were running the general store together from 1907 to 1908, and Henry Cockendorfer probably started the store about 1906. Then um, A.H. brought out Henry in um, 1908. He turned around and uh, took in his brother-in-law as partner, and his brother-in-law was my grandfather, Fritz Schlustein, and uh, they ran the general store together for two years again, 1909 to 1910. And, um, then they continued running it for about four more years to 1915 together, uh, but then they split up the business and, uh, and A.H. went into the upper end of the store building, uh, which was the hardware store for many years, and uh, operated that kind of business and started getting into cars. And uh, Fritz uh, Schlustein stayed in the right-hand side and stayed in the uh, general store business. This is the same building again then. Um, shows it uh, when it was, this would have been then between 1906 and 1908 when it was uh, being operated solely by Henry Cockendorfer. And uh, this is a great picture here again too because um, uh, you can see there's one fellow sitting up there on the top of the roof looking out for the picture. and. Um, we, we cer certainly should know who that fellow is, but we don't have it down there. But it's got to be Henry and his wife, the two that are sitting in the doorway, standing in the doorway there. This shows after, he, after they added the uh, extra space to the left and got right up to the corner of the building, or I mean to the corner of the lot, and uh, after it was being operated with uh, persons on both sides of it. And uh, this, was, this was a period of time when uh, Henry was first running it together with A.H. Rohr, and then later A.H. Rohr and Fritz Schlusting were running it uh, in the two different sides there. This next one's a front picture back at that same period of time, and um, this shows it when it was the Rohr Schlustein uh, general store, when the two of them would have been operating it together, which probably is going to be uh, somewhere around um, 1909, uh, 1910, that general time period. And uh, 
We, we of course, can identify some of these people here. Here's A.H. Uh, Roar right here. These are the Roar children right here. Back in the doorway there, uh, right back there, that's Fred Schlustein, and these are some, some of the members of his family there. Um, on the left side, in, the, uh, in front of Fred, is, is May Schlustein. Uh, All right, then uh, going on to some of the big festivities that they sometimes had. Uh, when the 4th of July came, parade came in 1910, this is the 1910, one of the 1910 floats for the 1910 parade in Cochrane. And uh, the different businessmen would uh, get floats going. The firemen's band would lead the procession. There'd be decorated riding buggies. There'd be horses with pom-poms in their halters. And uh, they go all the way down to Klein's Picnic uh, Park. And you had to have a printed lapel uh, ribbon commemorating the day. And then they had lots of things down at the park. And these were the kind of things that they celebrated on the 4th of July doing, according to the paper back at that time. Uh, ring tossing at canes, ball throwing at dolls, spinning the wheel to chance, fish bonds, uh, fi um, fish ponds, yeah. Um, sack races, and hitting the dinner bell with a 10-pound maul. Plenty of food included, including spirited drinks and pink lemonade, depending upon your choice, apparently. Uh, and then the evening would be topped off with an all-night dance at the Park Royal. Not a late one o'clock dance, but an all-night dance. Uh, from up here, on this particular picture here on the left hand, uh, the left-hand person there that's uh, sort of dressed in a clownish way is Otto Monk, and the, uh, the indication was that Otto didn't have to work hard to, to act like a clown. And the next one over there that's driving is Edgar Keller, and uh, then up in the doorway again then, uh, Fred Schlustein, and um, the, the little shaver on the, on the right there, that's my father, Bill Schlustein. Now, just across the street, where the horseshoe pitching lot is now, that was where the blacksmith shop was for so many years. And so I'm sure a lot of you remember the blacksmith shop. And the, uh, the Cochrane blacksmith shop was one of the first buildings built in Cochrane, again built by Henry Cochrane. Henry Cochrane had built probably at least a dozen of Cochrane's buildings. And uh, he built the blacksmith shop as one of his first buildings in 1888. He actually operated it originally as a blacksmith himself, but he became involved in so many other things that he was only in there a short time and, uh, and uh, brought in other blacksmiths to continue it. This particular picture is 1920. The blacksmith is uh, Lind Krogi. There were a lot of other persons that were blacksmiths in this shop over the years, including John Schlustein, Louis Gans, August Gans, William Schleen, Herman Zeichert, John Toma, Hawkins Rockneby, and Oliver Body, all names I'm sure familiar to many of us, and all persons who at one time or another were blacksmiths in that shop at some time. Later in the early years that I can remember, uh, uh, the blacksmith shop continued operating, uh, finished operating as a blacksmith shop and uh, became a storage building. E.H. Roar brought it then and used it as a storage building. I think it's really appropriate that the lot that's being used, that this lot that was a, a shop in which they made horseshoes all these years is now being used as a lot to pitch horseshoes. <laughs> I don't know if any of you remember uh, this little store and if you go uh, north just past the uh, horseshoe pitching lot, the next house there, that used to be the Maggie Shep residence and I can't remember who her husband was, but she and her husband ran a little grocery store there in that little bay window area there. And I remember that uh, I would go there commonly as a young boy because those were the biggest jawbreakers in town. And in the front here, we've got the, that picture identified. And here you can see, this is uh, Robert Stern in the uh, 
Wagoneer, and he's hauling butter to the depot in 1905, according to the information on the back of that picture. This is a 1905 picture then. And uh, Robert Stern, that's the father of uh, Edwin and Oscar. Pardon? Otto Shem, that's right. <coughs> Mark her down, Kelly. <laughs> now we're going to go up to the creamery. Um, my grandpa Fritz used to hire me to take my coaster wagon up to the creamery and get a supply of butter because he could, he could get butter directly from the creamery for two cents less than he could sell it for two cents a pound less than he could sell it for. Uh, I don't know what he paid me, I don't think he paid me anything. <laughs> anyway, this, this shows the interior of the old creamery back in 1903. And uh, the same Robert Stern here again, is, was the first butter maker in Cochrane. This shows him at it, and uh, the, shows him at the, chur at the churn, and the churn was being powered by, st by steam in those days. Uh, other butter makers that some of the older folks here may remember are Bob Slicester, Homer Hilton, and Vern Fleurine. Uh, Creamy closed in 1970, and of course now it's the body shop of Bob Letha. Now we're up to the end of town. We're on the Buffalo City Road looking back into Cochrane. And uh, this is a view that you don't get very often, but uh, shows the picture going in there with the, uh, in the area there where the elk farm now is on the right-hand side and uh, where the creamery would have been on the left-hand side of you looking into town. Now we're going to switch and go south from the main street. And this is the next house south at 209 South Main and uh, is the Klein House. And uh, at that time, it had the, uh, the high tower on it as well. It's been extensively uh, uh, changed in outer appearance. But uh, it was built by uh, a person who moved into town. And um, uh, I don't have his name on my particular notes at the particular time here. But um, who was quite influential in, in the development of some of the early Cochrane businesses. How does it look today? That's it. That's the same house. I should say a worthy project for the future. Did you know we had a cement block factory? And uh, we did have a cement block factory for a while. And that was the Basler. Uh, cement block factory right behind uh, uh, Ray Basler's house. This would have been um, right along back by that back street that runs right along by the railroad track. And uh, this shows the interior of the uh, cement block factory at that time. It's got Carl Seward and Fritz Burmeister and Jake Beck. And the person in the middle might be Herman Basler or Fritz Burmeister. Another picture of the cement block factory. And um, this one here, the person on the, on the left is Charlie Seward, and the one on the right is Elmer Rohr. Elmer Rohr was the one whose nickname was Hitchy, Hitchy Rohr. Now looking down, um, this is again looking north, but going farther down south and gets us just past the, uh, the old Lutheran church building, and that's the Lutheran church building on the left. Very early picture being taken before the, uh, uh, the pastor's house had been built right next door to it, but uh, this one's even earlier. This would have been probably right after that particular church was built because you can see there just isn't anything built up around it at all. And the church was built in 1902, and somehow or other it looks like it's just been finished. There's another view of this same general area, 
And this is taken from out in the, uh, in the field behind there, before there were any buildings behind there at all. And um, taken, um, again, we know that this picture would have been before 19, by 1902 when the church was built, but before 1915, because the parsonage isn't there and the parsonage was built in 1915. Another picture of the same church, again, before the parsonage was built. But now, a home on the left-hand side, right close to it. This is, um, again, on Main Street, a little bit farther down the street again, looking north. Um, again, when you see everything grown up like this, and they, they, they talk about the... Uh, the poor Adirondacks and the Ozarks and the, the, uh, the conditions that some people have to live in today. Uh, I think everybody on this street thought they were doing pretty good. Now, here's the old uh, Henry Cockendeffer gas station, right across from where the old school used to be on the railroad side there, and right at the corner where you turn leaving Cochrane at the south end to go out to the highway. And uh, this was back at the time when Highway 35 ran right through the village of Cochrane. All the main travel was going right through Cochrane at that time. It would have then been the first gas station on the south side. And um, the grand opening of this station was 1931. One of the things that was really exciting about it was it had uh, neon lighting. Uh, and there's remnants of it still left going across the top of the building and up and down the gable there. And uh, during the depression period of time, and they're still there, they built two little tourist cabins out behind it and uh, rented them out to people that were tourists that were going by there. For many, many years, this was um, uh, run by Pearl Stock, which was one of Henry Cockendever's daughters. And uh, being right across from school, one of the things that uh, if, if any of us school children had the necessary cash to do it, this was a great noon hour break for pop and candy. It was right across the street from the school. Same side of the street, going south. First school built in Cochrane. Not exactly sure about the exact location of this, but this was the first school built in Cochrane. It was a one-room school. Actually, Cochrane, or what was originally Belvedere, Cochrane had a school long before Cochrane had anything built up in Cochrane, and it was the uh, joint school district for Belvedere. It was actually the first school district formed in the entire county of Buffalo. There was a private school being operated in Holmes' Landing or Fountain City, but the first organized district that was ever formed in Buffalo County was, was formed in 1855 in what is now the Klein Farmhouse right in that yard area of theirs. This would have been the next building built and uh, probably would have been on this side of where the old railroad tracks or where the railroad tracks are now and operated as a one-room school for quite a number of years before Cochran was ever even settled or organized as far as 1886 is concerned. Uh, but we know that this picture was taken um, sometime after 1896 because it was expanded from a one-room school to a two-room school in 1896. And they expanded it from one room to two rooms by going up. That's the second story. Then for years, uh, the Elmer Blank House on the corner there uh, was the schoolhouse in Cochrane for many years. And this shows the interior of that building. And this shows it was room one and room two again all the eighth grades in, in two different rooms. This shows room one and shows all the various students there. Again, it would be a, a very early picture here. The, um, and this shows room number two. You can see the blackboards up in the back and all. notice how all the school children are dressed. And these pictures would be before 1915 because that's when the school was, the newer school was built across the way.
This uh, is also in that um, earlier school, the one that was in what was later the Elmer Blank uh, remodel, it's the Elmer Blank's residence. Includes the upper grades room, again before 1915. Um, there's uh, various persons that we can uh, identify on there, and if you can help us with any of them along the line, I'd be glad to have them. I know one of them in there is uh, an aunt of mine, May Schlustein. Then they built the new school, which isn't there anymore, which is now torn down and gone, yeah, but the, uh, the school that, uh, that I'm sure many of the people in the room went to and that I went to. And, um, this shows the building of that school. It was built in 1915. I, I, when I was a boy, I thought that was about the biggest building that a per, the building could be, you know. And it, uh, it was built in 1915, and it cost $18,000 to build it in 1915. And uh, this shows some of the builders of the school. And um, there's a Probst and a Bollinger and a Schultz, and the, um, about we don't know exactly who is who on the picture. Again, anybody can help us with those. We'd appreciate it, though I would assume a number of these are probably builders that were not from the immediate area. This shows it the way I'm sure a lot of you will remember it. The um, uh, grade schools on the first floor here, uh, the grades uh, one through seven, or being one through eight, the high school on the upper level, I always thought I always thought the high school was called the high school because it was upstairs, it was higher. You know. And then they had a shop and a home ec and things like that in the basement area there. Picture taken out, you remember, always come spring of the year, time for the school to close and the school picnic and so on, you get all the kids out in front of the school and everybody's picture would be taken. And incidentally, we've got a tremendous collection of school pictures from all the schools in Buffalo County. At one time, Buffalo County had 92 operating schools in the Buffalo County. And uh, we've got all kinds of pictures of them with uh, lots of students that are identified. And uh, this uh, this picture here, we've uh, got identified a lot, of the pic a lot of the people in it, but nowhere near all of the people in it. But uh, this is back in the days, for instance, that Clarewin Klein would have been one of the persons on here. Arabelle Klein would have been on here. Hugo Teldorf's one of them on here. Um, uh, Carl Rohr, that gives you somewhat of an idea of the time period of that picture. And again, how do you like the sidewalk out in front of the, of, of the school? And the kids are really dressed up, aren't they? <laughs> this picture is taken uh, uh, just a little bit later. Uh, this would have been 1936. Um, and uh, this shows a lot of the kids that I would have known very well because I'm on this picture. And uh, uh, we've got every person on this particular picture identified. And... Uh, I have to point out to, whoops. You see, there I am in the right. And I hated that suit. And I hated those knickers. And she, my mother made me wear them that day because it was a school picture. And I finally got her though. The gypsies came to town. And we were having, we were playing out in the backyard. And I left the jacket for my suit outside when I went in for recess and the gypsies took it. <laughs> There's Marty Ressler right next to me, Laverne Engel, Wilbert Fetting, Pete Gettinger, Beverly Bollinger, Rhoda Florine, so on. Now going back a little bit earlier, of course had sports teams back then too, you know. This is uh, the first Cochran High School basketball team, and that was 1921. And the um, uh, persons in that picture from left to right, um, I don't have them here left to right, do I? Okay. Anyway, um, some of the people on the picture, um, my father's one of these pair persons here, that's him right here. And, um, uh, 
Laverne Rohr right next to him in the center. That's Laverne Rohr right there. And uh, Clayton Rohr is right next to him. Another one on the picture is Hooks Gons. Uh, now, back in those years, when they played an away game, they played it at Pepin. And you know how you got to Pepin for the away game? They, they got on the train when the train stopped up there at the depot. And they went up over the Trevina Crossing and so on, back in those railroad track days that don't even, where those tracks don't even exist anymore. They got to Pippin, they played the game, it was too late, there wasn't any train going back home anymore. So it was an overnight to play a game at Pippin. <laughs> my, my dad never scored a lot of points, but uh, some of those games that he played in, nobody scored points in. They won games like 8 to 5, <laughs> scores like that back at that time. They, they played in the old Bill Bollinger dance hall area, and if you can imagine how low those ceilings were. Uh, my, my dad always remembered the, the, the game that he was high point man on because he scored four points because they guarded all our other players. <coughs> then, of course, there's the first graduating class. I, um, and um, uh, <laughs> again, my dad was a member of that first graduating class. And this shows the um, a graduation program. Do you know that when my father got out of the eighth grade, Cochran didn't have a high school. And so they thought, well, maybe the people are thinking maybe we should get a high school going in Cochran. So they started one that year. But there's no sense in going into this thing whole hog overnight, you know. So they just hired one teacher and they had a freshman class. That was the high school. And they built this new building now, and that was part of the plan, you know. The next year, they hired a second teacher, and they had a freshman and sophomore class. The first year they had a senior class was the year my dad graduated, and that would have been 1921. And uh, it, just look at how many people were in the class. One, two, three, four, five. That was the whole senior class at that time but they still had one of these fancy graduation ceremonies at Bellinger's Hall. And of course, you'll remember that's where all the class plays used to be. And the proms used to be in the old Bollinger's Hall. Here again is the, uh, the Cochran High School basketball team, just a little bit later in a period of time. This is 1925 and 26. Um, the uh, first uh, player on the... Um, in the front row, uh, a second one over is Ray Baszler. Certainly looks like a Baszler, doesn't he? And uh, that's Alan Baszler right next to him. And then in the back, uh, uh, the coach was Earl Hildebrandt, if any of you remember him. And Oliver Body, and the next one over there, the third one up from the top, uh, on the, from the left, that's Howard Monk. And Alvin Gons, and then there's Clarwin Klein. He really distinctively uh, recognized it easily. And Melvin Mulek. This was the 1927 team. And uh, some of the people in here, though we don't have them all identified in the same way, Clarwin Klein's still on the team. Alan Baser's still on the team. Uh, Howard Monk's still on the team. Uh, Melvin Mulek's still on the team. This is uh, the basketball team statistics. You remember I was talking to you about the big games that they used to play there? And uh, this shows uh, uh, the number of games played, number of goals, uh, total free throws tried. So look at the sixth column, you know. This is for the whole season, you know. The sixth column, the one on the far right, that's how many points they scored in the whole year. Roger, you can sure be proud of Ray. He put in 111 points in the course of the whole year. He must have really been the outstanding center there. But then you go down there uh, uh, just a little bit farther and it, it drops off pretty fast. Must have been a pretty big celebration when you scored a basket. Then we got into the, the days when we had some really great basketball teams when uh, uh, we were conference champions there, and uh, this next picture is in that period of time there. And um, 
that's when Ralph Leahy's great team started uh, playing. And uh, this was uh, back just shortly before I got out of high school, or just shortly before I got into high school. And um, Ralph Leahy brought in some ideas of, uh, that uh, changed the way basketball was played in our area. First man to bring fast break to our local basketball teams. And I uh, had some great teams, and this was a particularly outstanding team here this particular year there. And if you go to the first row here, um, the one on the left is uh, George Engel Jr. The next one is John Von Wald, who was our big time star, who one time made the front page of the Winona paper because he scored over 20 points in one game. <laughs> then it's Willard Blank and uh, Hilbert uh, Gifford, Chubby Gifford, and uh, Archie Bookmiller. In the back, uh, Laverne Eikamp was always the dependable manager for the basketball teams in those years. And uh, Gordon Dinger was the assistant manager. And the next one over there is Gordy Foss. His father was principal in those years. Uh, Lyle Hofer. Lyle, there you are. And uh, Bobby Bollinger and uh, Gail Letha. Watson Vaughn and Ralph Lay. Now you had to learn something practical too. And uh, in high school you didn't have all the electives that you have now, you know. If you were a girl, the only elective you had was home ec. And if you were a, a boy, or home ec or commercial. And if you were a boy, the only uh, electives that you had were um, commercial or ag. And uh, this is the ag class. It's the ag class in 1944. Alan Baszler's teaching it. It would have been in the uh, basement room of the, uh, of the uh, school building there, and it would have been on the north side is where that classroom always used to be. And from the left to the right here, again, we got George Friedrich Janders well, uh, filling in on this thing and make sure he knows what's happening here. Uh, right next to him is Clarwin Klein, who wouldn't have been a student. He'd been in there helping teach the class. And Oscar Stern, the same way. And uh, then over there, right at the end of the line, we got uh, Gene Farner. And um, the next one over there is Edwin Stern. Everybody called him Soupy Stern. And uh, Alan Basler again teaching the class. And then uh, Ray Farner, again in there, another farmer helping the class. And uh, Roger Basler in the back. And uh, toward the front, uh, Alan Basler and Orion Heyer. Then, uh, in closing, I just wanted to spend a little time going through some of the pictures that we've accumulated of things that happened and took place in Cochrane and involved people in the different organizations. The first band that we ever had in Cochrane, and bands were really a big thing in the early years, you know, you didn't go out of town for, for entertainment, you, you had to have entertainment locally. And the first band, band that was ever formed in Cochrane was 1890. This picture here is the first band that was formed. It's called the Excelsior Band. And it's in what was at that time called Cookwell's Park. That's the area that's um, uh, right next to the ballpark, uh, where, where the old ballpark used to be, where the Florine House uh, uh, later was, uh, that whole area there that's now built up by houses at one time was the Cookwell Park and the uh, field land right behind it there. Then um, the next band, after a while the Excelsior Band reorganized and they became the Cochran Firemen's Band. And that, that was organized around 1910. You remember in the 1910 Fourth of July parade, the Cochran Firemen's Band led that parade. And uh, we've got uh, all kinds of people identified on here. Um, the, uh, from the left to the right in the back row, I love some of these names, like the first one was Alfred Paul, but his nickname is Puddles. And he was on snare drums, and, Alfred Gettinger was on baritone. Uh, I won't go through all these, because we, but we do have them all identified as to uh, who they were and what they played. The um, little fellow right in the front of the drum there on the left there, that's Beaumont Hofer, Bomi Hofer. The next band they had was, uh, was the Cochran Cadet Band. And uh, that operated for a number of years. It was m more younger persons. 
Again, this is a picture that we've got completely identified as far as every member of that band. And uh, that would have been, this particular picture would have been taken in 1917. We've got up at the Historical Society the, the old uh, uh, flag banner that they used to carry in all of their parades as well. This shows the Cochran High School Band. Uh, after the city bands were starting to die down, the, uh, the school bands became more prominent. The, um, this, uh, this particular one would have probably been um, around 1950, somewhat in that area there. Uh, Carl Rohr is the one that's, uh, no, that's not Carl. Eunice Kaiser is the second one from the right. Uh, my brother Ken Schlustein's on there, and he was eight years younger than I am. Again, this is one that we should be able to identify every one of the names on. And if any of you are from the vintage of this picture, we'd really appreciate you getting together with us afterwards and trying to identify as many of them as we can. Now going way back, the big game in the early years was ball, uh, baseball. And they used to have regular um, teams back and forth with all the neighboring communities. You know, we'd play Harold, we'd play Cream, we'd play Elmo, we'd play Fountain City. Uh, and uh, the rivalry was great. And this shows the Cochran Star Ball Club. It was called the Cochran Star Ball Club. You see the, the uniform there has got a C with a star in the center of it. And this shows the 1910 Ball Club. Standing up on the left-hand side. Pretty cocky-looking bunch, aren't they? That's Ray Gettinger on the left. Wilfred Kaufman next. Then we got George Rohr. Dewey Huber. John Lindred. Mildor Lindred. And Irvin Schultz. In the front row, we got John Fetting sitting down there, better known as Snoozy. Robert Morning. Emil Krummels who was the butter maker at that time. And we've got one of the original shirts from that baseball team time. Then uh, here's some of the movers and shakers in early Cochrane. This was the Cochrane Commercial Club. And uh, it shows the uh, people back there, the early years, this would have been in the early 1900s sometime probably. And includes a lot of the names that we've been talking about. Henry Cockendeffer is the fellow that's up there on the left-hand side on the, in the back row there. And um, uh, R. Huber's next to him. Uh, e. e. Gettinger is next to him. Uh, Richard Heyer. Uh, Butch Monk again. Uh, August Kurtzwig. J.B. Hofer again. Uh, A.W. Hofer. Fred Miley. Fred Miley was the depot agent. And um, then in the front row, J.L. Rohr, one of the two Rohr brothers, with G.M. Rohr right next to him. And um, Ferd Hansen, who ran that uh, place on the corner there, that sold the implements. One of the persons that built the um, first store, of course, was G.M. Rohr, and he was very active in, uh, in politics and, and, and in business in Cochrane for many, many years. It was involved in a lot of different things. Uh, put this picture in because it was just such a good picture of him, and it showed him when he ran for assembly in 1930. He was unsuccessful in running for it, but he was uh, chairman of the county board for a number of years. He was the first president of the village board of Cochran for many years after it uh, was formally organized. I put this one in because I know quite a bit about this guy. Uh, and uh, because some of this history, I think, is kind of interesting. Uh, when, when my dad, Bell Schlustein, came to town, it was 1932. It was the heart of the Depression. Um, there was one lawyer in town already, Oliver Winandy. Um, my dad would get together with uh, Emmett Miley, who came to town the same year. There was one doctor in town. That was uh, uh, Dr. Bailitz. So, Bell Schlestein and Emmett Miley didn't have much business at all the first couple of years. And uh, they'd get together um, about uh, mid-morning to uh, talk about whether or not they'd had any customers. And they'd sit on the old bank corner steps for a while. And then they'd 
Then they'd each pitch a penny toward the center line. The one that got the closest to the center line got to keep the two cents, and then they go back to the office again. Uh, anyway, um, a few years after he was here, in 1938, that would have been after he was here four years, he got elected as district attorney, and at that time that job paid the princely sum of $65 a month and was district attorney for 14 years, from 1938 to 1952. Um, if we think $65 a month was uh, a princely salary, uh, I became district attorney in 1954, and at that time it still only paid $165 a month. But I remember how, how happy he was to have won this election because it meant bread on the table. That $65 came in really handy. Now, let's get to the ladies, huh? Here are the sewing girls from way back. This is a turn of the century picture. It would be around 1900. And uh, it includes uh, Mrs. Herman Helms on this picture, uh, and Anna Schmidt's on this picture, uh, Mrs. Bill Bollinger's on this picture, that was Elvina Bollinger, and uh, they were, this was the little local sewing group that would get together. Good. Didn't, you, didn't you like those clothes back there? Right. It took a seamstress to make them, didn't it? Pretty nice hairdos, too. How'd you like to walk into a beauty shop today and say, hey, hey, do me like this. <laughs> and here's another one of the girls. And this is about 1910. And the big fad at that time was white waists and long, dark skirts. And this was the White Waisted Girls Club. <laughs> and from left to right, we've got um, Gladys Gettinger, who became a morning. Belva Rohr, who married an Eibach. Elizabeth Pegglesdorf, Rohr, uh, Flora Rohr Florine, Hazel Huber Evans, Vernie Huber, who didn't marry, Della Hofer Gilbert, and Palma Rohr Engelhardt. And a lot of you probably remember uh, Della Gilbert's uh, great dinners over at Buffalo City where we could get a, a whole uh, fish dinner for 15 cents, later went up to a quarter and uh, a, a, a batter fried chicken dinner for uh, um, 25 cents and you later went up to 35 cents. Oops, wrong direction. And this takes us to the end of the show today and this is the way it used to be leaving town as you travel to the south and this shows somebody coming into Cochran from the south end of town. Thank you for your attention. Hope you enjoyed it. If anybody's got any information to give to Kelly, do so. <laughs>